Okay, so we'll start with the respiratory system. So when we're talking about the thoracic cavity, we have a couple different ways to describe it. Thoracic cavity is one, and it's referring to the thorax, which means the area where the lungs and the ribs are. The other way to describe it is the pleural cavity. And we'll talk a little bit about the pleural lining. <clears throat> but the pleural cavity um, is one way to describe the thorax. And when we're talking about the abdomen in the same context, it would be the peritoneal cavity. So the peritoneum and the pleural, um, two different ways to describe thorax and abdomen. <coughs> so the thoracic cavity <coughs> is bound by the thoracic vertebrae dorsally, ribs and intercostal muscles laterally, and the sternum ventrally. The mediastinum or mediastinum, however you would like to pr pronounce it, it's fine. That's the area, so the gap between the two lungs. And within the media, mediastinum contains the heart, trachea, esophagus, blood vessels, nerves, and lymphatic structures. Looking at our thoracic cavity here, um, so in this particular one, they're identifying the cranial lobe of the lung, the caudal lobe of the lung. And we'll talk about the lung in a little bit more detail in a minute because the lung's divided into numerous lobes depending on the type of species that it is. So where the heart sits and also where the trachea sits, that is the medias, <coughs> excuse me, mediastinum. And then the diaphragm, so the diaphragm is a dome-shaped skeletal muscle, and it's a muscle that's in a big broad sheet, and it forms the caudal boundary of the thorax. It's a really important respiratory muscle. So when, uh, when it contracts, it flattens out, so otherwise when it's relaxed, it sits in a dome shape, and the peak of the dome, the apex of the dome, is cranial. When it contracts, it flattens out and it enlarges the volume of the thorax and aids, aids in inspiration. So the pleura, when we refer to the thoracic cavity as the pleural cavity, what we're essentially referring to is this thing called the pleura. And the pleura is a very thin membrane that lines the thoracic cavity and covers all the organs and structures in the thorax. There's a visceral layer. Uh, that covers the thoracic organs and structures, and the parietal layers line uh, the cavity. So we'll talk about the visceral and parietal layers. Visceral is deeper layer, parietal is more superficial, and you'll see what I'm talking about a bit more too when we start talking about the heart and the pericardium. The space between these two layers, so the pleura is the membrane, and then the pleura itself is made up of two sheets, right? So the visceral and the uh, parietal. The space between these two pleural layers is filled with a very small amount of pleural fluid. This helps ensure that the surface of the organs slides smoothly along the lining of the thorax during inspiration and expiration. So the primary function of the respiratory system, as we all know since we've been alive and in school forever, is to bring oxygen into the body and carbon dioxide out of the body. The respiratory system works together with the cardiovascular system. So once the blood has exchanged the oxygen for carbon dioxide, it has to get taken back by the capillaries, by the blood vessels, and uh, brought into the heart for circulation. Secondary functions of the respiratory system are phonation, so voice production, regulation of body temperature, regulation of acid-base balance, and sense of smell. In regard to respiration, we can break it down into external respiration and internal respiration. External is physically the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide between the inhaled air and the blood flowing through the pulmonary capillaries. Internal respiration is exchange of O2 and CO2 between the blood and the systemic capillaries and all the cells and tissues of the body. So we have the actual physical exchange of the oxygen for carbon dioxide or sorry, carbon dioxide for oxygen in the blood. And then as it gets broken down more into tissue and into cellular layer, or sorry, cellular aspect, that's what we're talking about internal respiration. So it's the actual exchange of the two uh, between the cells of the tissues of the body. When we're talking about the respiratory system, it, we break it up into upper respiratory tract and lower respiratory tract. Upper respiratory tract we'll often talk about with cats. In clinic, so clinical application would be cats getting upper respiratory tract infections. 
Um, very common, very common to spread the viruses that cause those upper respiratory tract infections, such as chlamydia, herpes, um, obviously not quite the same strain as we our minds might go to thinking about chlamydia and herpes for people. But herpes viruses are everywhere throughout the body and they tend to show up in different ways. For people, chicken pox is actually a herpes virus as well. But with cats, uh, it shows up in the eyes and in the nose and they get all clogged up and it completely blocks up their upper respiratory tract. So these are the guys that when we we're talking about the senses, the sensory organs, if they're all clogged up with mucus and gunk, they're not going to want to eat. So this is what we're talking about in regard to upper respiratory tract. We are talking about the nostrils, which more appropriately are called the nares, the nasal passages, the pharynx, the larynx, and the trachea. Those all belong to upper respiratory. And this is a good image to look at, um, obviously one to get to know for sure, but uh, in a minute we're going to talk about the way the esophagus and the trachea sit within the, the sort of upper respiratory tract. So the trachea sits ventrally in the neck region and the esophagus sits dorsally. So just keep that in mind because we'll come back to that. So the nares, i.e. the nostrils, are the external openings of the respiratory tube and they lead into the nasal passages. The nasal passages are between the nostrils and the pharynx. So this, so we've got our nostrils here, so our nares up here, <clears throat> and then through here are the nasal passages. The nasal septum separates the left and right nasal passages. Hard and soft palates separate the nasal passages from the mouth. So thinking about our own bodies, if we stick our tongue to the roof of our mouth, you can feel your hard palate. If you reach your tongue further back, you start to feel the soft palate. And that separates uh, nasal passages from the mouth. So turbinates are uh, something that you can look at in the skulls in the anatomy lab. Their little nasal conche is the other way, um, way to identify them, but they're tiny little scroll, and by scroll I mean when you roll up a map, that kind of scroll, that um, continuous circular pattern. Tiny little scroll-like bones, they're paper thin, and they divide each nasal passage into three main passageways. So thin little tiny scroll-like bones that have a very thin layer of epithelium, so skin-like tissue, that nice mucous membrane type tissue. Very thin layer of uh, epithelium. And we have scrolls dorsally and ventrally. They are turbinates, sorry. Nasal passages are lined with pseudostratified columnar epithelium. So when we're talking about pseudostratified columnar, that's talking about the specific shape of the cells themselves. So the important part about these cells is that they have tiny little cilia. So looking at this image here, these are your blood vessels. So this is within the mucosa of the nose. And by mu mucosa, we typically refer to that soft uh, epithelium. So same as when you pull down your eyelid and you see the pink conjunctiva, that's also called mucosa. Same as if you lift your lip and look at your gums, that's mucosa. So mucosa, um, so the cilia, sorry, on these pseudostratified columnar epithelial cells is really important. I love the thing. So it's really important because it helps uh, um, capture foreign bodies, foreign material, when it enters the nasal passages. And then that foreign material gets stuck in that thick layer of mucus that sits over these cells. And then the mucus allows uh, is an, has an ability to trap it, and then it can be coughed or, or blown out. And the mucus is secreted from mucus glands and goblet cells. And goblet cells you tend to see all throughout the body, um, a lot in the digestive tract as well, but just as an aside. <coughs> so the functions of the nasal passageways are to warm, humidify, and filter air, the inhaled air. The air is warmed by blood flowing through the blood vessels just beneath the nasal epithelium. So going back to this photo or this picture here, the, the blood vessels that are sitting under the nasal epithelium, so those are the epithelial cells, that warms the air as it comes through. It's humidified by the mucus and other fluids on the epithelial surface, so the mucus up top here. And it's filtered um, in part as it passes through the winding passages produced by the turbinates. 
So particles don't readily pass through but become trapped in the mucus layer. The cilia move the mucus and trap foreign material upwards to the pharynx in the mouth and it can be expelled at that point. The pharynx is, common, is a common passageway for respiratory and digestive systems. The soft palate div divides the pharynx into the dorsal nasal pharynx, which is associated with respiration, and the ventral oral pharynx, which is more so digestive. The caudal end of the pharynx opens directly, or sorry, dorsally into the esophagus and ventrally into the larynx. So let's just go back to this image here. So this being the pharynx, the pharynx is essentially uh, the start of our throat. It's what we tend to refer to as our throat when our throat gets sore, that kind of thing. So looking at our pharynx, pharynx here, the dorsal aspect, aspect of the pharynx opens up to create the esophagus, to move into the esophagus, whereas the ventral opens up into the trachea. And trachea is for respiration, esophagus is for food. So this is a human anatomy diagram identifying the naso, na, nasopharynx, oropharynx, and the hypopharynx. Just to know in general what the pharynx is is a good idea, and to know that the trachea initially sits ventrally, and the esophagus initially sits dorsally, and then they switch as they enter the body. So the larynx is a short irregular tube connecting the pharynx with the trachea. It's composed of segments of cartilage that are connected to each other and the surrounding tissues by muscle, and it's supported in place by the hyoid bone. So that's why that hyoid bone is important to know. Has cartilage components, and those are the epiglottis, the arachnoid cartilages, thyroid cartilage, and cricoid um, cartilage. Main purpose, we have uh, voice production as a purpose. So when we're talking about our voice box, we're talking about our larynx. And mine, clearly today, is a little bit scratchy, so I sound uh, a little bit rough for wear. But that's my larynx that's causing those trouble. troubles. Sorry. Other function is it prevents food from being inhaled, which is hugely beneficial to us. Our vocal cords are two connective tissue bands attached to the arachnoid cartilages, and they're stretched across the openings of the lumen of the larynx parallel to each other. Vocal cords vibrate as air passes over them, and muscles attached to the arachnoid cartilages uh, control the tension of the vocal cords. So, of course, that essentially controls the pitch and the tone of voice production. This is a good image to get to know as well. This is our larynx, not ours, but it's a dog's larynx. So you can see you have the epiglottis, which is a piece of cartilage. The hyoid bone sits around the opening of the larynx to support the musculature. There's the thyrohyoid membrane. Thyroid cartilage, so as you can imagine, the thyroid gland, which we'll talk about, I don't even think I talk about it with you, perhaps Dr. Parr talks about it, but the thyroid gland just sits on either side of the larynx, so right up, uh, kind of around the Adam's apple area, if we had to compare it to ourselves. And then we have cricothyroid muscles, cricoid cartilage, cricothyroid lig ligament, and trachea. And the trachea we'll talk about in a sec, that's made up of bands of cartilage itself. So this little epiglottis at the top, it kind of looks like a tongue just because they've colored it pink. It's a single sort of leaf shape uh, piece of cartilage and it projects forward from the ventral portion of the larynx. During swallowing, the epiglottis is pulled back to cover the opening of the larynx. So the epiglottis acts as a little trap door to prevent food from going down the, the trachea. The larynx and the pharynx are two components that work together. So when we swallow, then it's going to stimulate the larynx to open up, or sorry, to block the, uh, sorry, I'm not speaking properly, to lift up the epiglottis to block the trachea so that when we're swallowing food, it's not going to go down the trachea. So reflexes control actions of the muscles around the pharynx. The larynx and the pharynx work together to prevent swallowing from interfering with breathing and vice versa. Swallowing, breathing stops, opening to the larynx is covered with the epiglottis. The material, so the bolus of food to be swallowed, moves to the rear of the pharynx and the esophagus opens up. After swallowing, the larynx is reopened and breathing resumes normally. The trachea, um, also called windpipe, but <laughs> totally not the anatomical way to call it. So the trachea is a short, wide tube and it extends from the larynx into the thorax. 
It divides into the two main bronchi that enter the lungs, and that division of the trachea into bronchi is called bifurcation of the trachea. So we'll talk about that a little bit when we look at the picture. It's composed of fibrous tissue and smooth muscle and held open. So the trachea is an always open tube. So when you see it on an x-ray, it looks black because it's always filled with air. And we'll look at some x-rays as we get into respiratory in lab too. So it's an always open tube and it's held open constantly by hyaline cartilage rings. It's also lined with ciliated epithelial cells. And those again allow to trap foreign material they are covered in mucus, and then we can cough that foreign material out as required. So now we're getting into the lower respiratory tract. So components of the lower respiratory tract include the bronchi, and bronchi is plural, bronchus is singular, the bronchioles, alveolar ducts, and the alveoli. So we've got trachea. This area where it divides is called bifurcation of the trachea and it divides into the right and the left bronchus. From there we have the bronchial tree which is a further extension of the bronchi and then we have bronchioles is sort of where it branches out into small branches essentially. And at the very ends of each bronchiole, so where it just seems like a flat line here, you in fact have tiny little alveoli du al alveolar ducts which are attached to alveoli. And alveoli we'll talk about because they're super important in regard to respiration. So the bronchial tree, what that's, um, sorry, bronchial tree, this is the bronchial tree. So it contains the alveolar ducts and at the uh, ducts, sorry, <laughs> the alveolar ducts and in groups of alveoli. So alveoli are these tiny little grape-like structures and they're really only the size of approximately a cell, perhaps a little bit bigger than a, a cell. But they're tiny, they, they're really like grapes, and they even cluster like grapes. So alveoli are tiny little clusters, they're filled with a gel-like fluid, and they're responsible for cellular exchange of carbon dioxide for oxygen. So this is where essentially the oxygen is absorbed into the body, it's through the alveoli. Alveolar sacs are little groups of alveoli, and the ducts is in regard to the, the veins and the, capi or the capillaries and the arterioles, so tiny, tiny, tiny little vessels that connect them in order to deposit and uh, exchange the carbon dioxide and oxygen. So alveoli, clinical application for alveoli, very, very important when we're talking about general anesthetic. So when an animal is placed under general anesthetic, Typically what happens is they get a sedation in the muscle, so they feel nice and tired, nice and relaxed, and then we give them a general anesthetic agent through their vein. So the general anesthetic enters the vein, they go asleep, so they lose all reflexes immediately. While they've lost their reflexes, we pass an endotracheal tube, also called ET tube, so endotracheal tube goes into their trachea. And what that does is it maintains an open trachea. It ensures that it just went. It ensures that the respiratory tract remains open at all times and prevents any vomiting or any regurgitation from going down into the, the trachea itself. So the endotracheal tube is passed into the trachea and uh, once it's in there, we're able to breathe for the animal. So the animal will typically resume breathing on their own, but if they stop breathing, we can breathe for them. Something that happens not too uh, rarely in general anesthetic is that the animal doesn't breathe to their full capacity. So we give them these agents, these sedation agents, these general anesthetics, that depress respiratory function. So it's, it's a depression agent. So instead of taking a nice deep breath when their body tells them to take a nice deep breath, they just take this bare minimum type breathing. So what that can do is it prevents air from going to all the alveoli in the caudal lungs. And if air doesn't get to the alveoli, the alveoli will start to collapse. And that term is called atelectasis, and that's alveolar collapse.
So in order to prevent this during a general anesthetic, we often give the animals a breath inflate to the full capacity determined by a specific pressure. So inflate to the full capacity of their lungs to ensure that all the alveoli in the tiny little crevices within their lungs are getting inflated, or sorry, are getting touched with air so that they continue this cellular respiration. So alveolar collapse is called atelectasis. It's a really good term to get to know, and we'll talk about it a little bit in regard to general anesthetic when we have our lab. So lungs, when we're talking about the lungs, um, obviously these are preserved lungs. So lungs are very, very, very soft tissue, and we'll, we'll look at a set of lungs in the lab as well. Their convex lateral surfaces lie against the inner surface of the thoracic ball. Okay, so obviously lateral surface is the inner thoracic surface, or inner lateral surface of the thoracic wall. The mediastinum is this area here. It's the area between the two lungs. So it's that gap between the two lungs where the heart sits, where the trachea sits, and where lymphatic and blood vessels sit as well. And as noted, just going back to that, as noted previously, uh, the lungs are divided into various lobes. So we've got a lobe here, a lobe here, and then one large lobe here, and that's going to be species dependent. Something that's really important to know within uh, the thoracic cavity is the thoracic cavity in general uh, especially the lungs, are under negative pressure. So what that means is it takes effort to actually breathe in. So in order to inspire air, it takes effort. And think about it yourself. Take a deep breath. Feel all those external intercostal muscles pulling the, the rib cage open. Your diaphragm is uh, pushing downward into your abdomen. And then when you relax those muscles, you, the air comes back uh, out of your lungs. So it takes more effort to breathe in than it does to breathe out. Uh, negative pressure, what that means is pretty much the thorax is a little vacuum, so it's kept under sort of vacuum pressure. And if you're ever completing a necropsy, when you enter the thoracic area, so when you enter the, the pleural cavity with a knife or with a cutting agent, you'd expect to hear a psst sound when you enter the thoracic cavity. And that means that that animal's thoracic cavity was still under negative pressure uh, before they died. So inspiration is the process of drawing air into the lungs, okay, so inhalation, results from enlargement of the volume of the thoracic cavity by the inspiratory muscles. Main inspiratory muscles, so this is a good one to know, are the diaphragm and the external intercostal muscles. The external intercostal muscles are located in the external portion of the intercostal spaces, so between the ribs. And you can think about it as you're breathing in, your thorax, or sorry, your rib cage is moving laterally, it's moving superficially outward, and your diaphragm is pulling down into your abdomen to create open lung space. Expiration, on the other hand, is the process of pushing air out of the lungs, so exhalation, and it results from decreased size of thoracic cavity. Main muscles involved in expiration are the internal intercostal muscles and the abdominal muscles. The internal intercostal muscles are located between the ribs, deep to the external intercostal muscles. So contraction of the abdominal muscles pushes abdominal organs against the diaphragm and pushes the diaphragm back into its full dome shape. So if you have ever taken yoga and they tell you to work on deep breathing exercises, this is where you get a really good feel about what muscles specifically are being used for inspiration. Breathing a nice big deep breath in, your muscles are pulling your rib cage outward, and then expiration, you can always feel your abdominal muscles getting involved and pushing those organs right up to the diaphragm to help condense the space in the lungs. All right, so next up we have the cardiovascular system. So as you can imagine with the cardiovascular system, we're talking about the heart, and the cardiovascular system is very closely related to the pulmonary system, pulmonary being lungs. So typically when we're talking about the two together, it's cardiopulmonary. So cardiopulmonary function is identifying how well the heart and lungs are working together. Lots of learning objectives, so you can have a look through those. I keep forgetting to move this image. <laughs> 
So it's just jumping ahead and identifying the artery itself and how it's set up in regard to muscle and uh, various connective tissue layers. So the artery we'll look at in a minute, but just to note the layers, we've got the tunica media, tunica externa, and the tunica interna, or in, intima, sorry, sorry, like intimate, intima, and then the basement membrane. So just don't worry about it too, too much for now, and we'll come back to it. So we'll start off by talking about the differences between veins and arteries, and a big hint is that this is super important to know, not just for tests, but it's going to come up routinely through med class, through surgery, etc. So veins carry blood toward the heart. Blood flow is passively directed by a skeletal muscle contraction, so it's called the uh, skeletal muscle pump. Valves are present in veins, and there's no pulse present. Arteries carry blood away from the heart. Biggest artery is the aorta, and that's coming right from the heart. That's the main artery stem from the heart. Arteries have a very thick layer of muscle in their arterial walls. So the way that blood moves through arteries is by arterial muscle. So they're self-sufficient in passing blood through the body. In veins, on the other hand, as mentioned before, they use the skeletal muscle pump. So what that means is that the veins don't have any muscle in the walls of the veins. So veins are just basically connective tissue. And if you think about it, um, when your leg falls asleep, so if you're sleeping, your leg falls asleep, or you've got cross leg, your leg falls asleep, what do you do to get that leg to have the feeling come back? So first off, your leg is falling asleep because the circulation is, is gone or it's compromised. So we're losing circulation in our leg. What are we going to do to increase the circulation back into our leg? First thing you do, you get up and you shake out your leg. So that's good, a good example of the skeletal muscle pump. Veins can't actively push the blood around on their own. So they use the use, uh, sorry, they, they use skeletal muscles, such as the various muscles throughout our legs, like our quadriceps, hamstrings, etc., to move that blood throughout the veins and push it where it needs to go back toward the heart. Valves are not present in arteries. So veins have much less uh, regular pressure in them. So the blood pressure in veins is quite low compared to that of arteries and when we're measuring blood pressure we're talking about arterial blood pressure in general. But, so because of that high pressure and the musculature in the arteries, blood just continuously flows. Okay, You don't often have a backflow of blood in an artery except in rare, rare conditions. Veins, because they're under such low pressure, need valves to prevent backflow of blood. And lastly, you can feel pulse in the arteries, and in veins you cannot. Capillaries are the smallest of all blood vessels. Their thickest layer is only one cell thick. They assist with the exchange of oxygen, carbon dioxide, water, and other nutrients at a cellular level. All right, so let's look at the composition of the heart. So the heart has a sac around it, and that sac is called the pericardium. So the pericardium is the outermost layer of the heart, and the pericardium itself is broken up into three layers. So kind of like we talked about before, um, being broken up into three layers, the pleural lining is broken up into two layers, and it has a fluid in between the two layers, very similar with the pericardium. So the pericardium is generally um, a fairly firm fibrous connective tissue sac that the heart sits within. So the pericardium layers, we have the outermost layer is called the fibrous pericardium. It protects the heart and it loosely attaches the heart to the diaphragm. Okay, you can see some connection to the diaphragm. The next layer of the pericardium is called the parietal pericardium. So the parietal layer is directly under the fibrous pericardium. And then under that, we have a gap. So the black line identifies a gap, and that's called the pericardial cavity. And under the gap is the visceral parietal, or sorry, the visceral pericardium. So the visceral layer. So it goes fibrous pericardium, parietal pericardium, then visceral pericardium. In the space between the parietal and the visceral pericardium is pericardial fluid. And there are some conditions, medical conditions, where you can get pericardial effusion, 
and that's a buildup of the fluid within the pericardium between those two layers, between the parietal and the visceral layer. Okay, really high-tech drawing, nice and pixelated, high-end. So getting into the pericardium, uh, again, this is a very high-tech drawing that identifies the three different layers. Outermost pericardium is the fibrous pericardium. And then we have the parietal pericardium. And then we have the pericardial cavity, which is sort of this light bluey-gray color. And then the visceral layer of serous pericardium. Okay, so three layers of the pericardium. Then we start getting into the layers of the heart itself. So that's what this is trying to show you. I won't talk about that. So the myocardium is located inside the sac formed by the pericardium. It's the thickest layer of heart tissue. And if you recall from um, etymology, myo refers to muscle. So myopericard or sorry, myocardium is the muscular layer of the heart. And as you can imagine, because the heart is one big muscle and it's continuously uh, using energy to pump, the myocardium is the very thickest layer. The endocardium is a very, very thin membranous lining between the myocardium and the chambers of the heart. So the endocardium actually touches the blood. This is a great drawing, a good one to, to get to know. So we have pericardium, so we have the fibrous pericardium, parietal pericardium, the pericardial cavity, and that's where fluid naturally sits, visceral pericardium, and then we have myocardium, which is the big muscular layer, and endocardium is just this thin little membrane inside the myocardium. So like I mentioned before, when we're talking about blood pressure, we're measuring arterial pressure. So we're measuring the constant and fluctuating pressure of the arteries, or of the blood within the arteries. When we talk about it, we get a reading that says systolic, overdiastolic, and mean arterial pressure. So systolic refers to systole, which is the contraction of the ventricles and emptying of the ventricles. Diastole, which gives us our diastolic blood pressure, is relaxation of the ventricles, so filling of the ventricles. And then we get mean arterial pressure, which is the constant overall pressure of the arteries. And to identify what the mean arterial pressure is, you have to do a math formula. So most, most machines just provide us with a mere mean arterial pressure. They do the math formula for us. So again, blood pressure, we present it in systolic over diastolic. And there's a nice little video here if you'd like to watch it in regard to blood pressure. This is a beautiful image from your textbook, and it's a good one to get to know. Um, when we're talking about the heart, we'll mostly focus on the inside of the heart and the exchange of blood throughout the heart, looking at the chambers. There also is the coronary artery. So when people have heart attacks, it's typically because their coronary artery is blocked. Okay, so we have various coronary arteries on the outside of the heart, and what they're doing is actually exchanging oxygen and carbon dioxide to the heart muscle itself. Okay, so they're continuously providing the heart muscle with oxygen and carbon dioxide. So as you can imagine, if an individual has blocked coronary arteries, they get a heart attack because that heart is not getting what it needs to survive. It's not getting oxygen, it's not getting rid of carbon dioxide. And then of course you have cardiac veins as well. Okay, that bring blood back into the heart. So they sort of, they have a little entrance and exit in the heart itself. So they bring that blood from the heart muscle dump it into the heart to be reoxygenated by the lungs. So knowing the flow of blood through the heart is a really, really good idea because you'll definitely be tested on it and you definitely want to understand it because uh, you'll be doing cardiac ultrasounds and you'll see patients with cardiac disease quite routinely in clinic. So the veins collect deoxygenated blood from all the tissues. The vena cava, and uh, vena cava is term for one, vena cava with AE is term for two, so when we're talking about two vena cavae. So the vena cavae enter into the right atrium. The blood passes through the right atrioventricular valve, also called the tricuspid, into the right ventricle of the heart. So we have two different types of valves that we're going to talk about in the heart. We have atrioventricular valves, which sit between the atria and the ventricles. So atrium, ventricle. 
And then we have these other little valves that are called semilunar valves. So the atrioventricular valves are very, very thin. They're, they're connective tissue. It's almost like a membrane. You'll see them when we look at the, the cow hearts, but very, very thin. Whereas the semilunar valves are a little bit more substantial. They're more of the, the heart tissue itself, muscular tissue. So we have semilunar valves, atrial ventricular valves. And again, here is a ventricle and an atrium. So we've got an atrial ventricular valve. They each have different names. One of them has three names. So you'll need to know um, the, the, the various types of names. I'm just going to point out a spelling error. This is from the textbook. Um, actually, no, I'll leave. That's, it's typically, we. I don't know why they use an A here. I'll see if it's truly a spelling error or just a different way of spelling it. But pulmonary. Pulmonary is P-U-L-M-O-N-A-R-Y. Pulmonary. Right there. Yeah, so that's spelling error. I've never seen it spelled another way. But anyways, that last image is from your textbook. But you can see the appropriate spelling here, pulmonary. So blood flows through the heart. So during systole, the right ventricle constricts, so it contracts, and the tricuspid valve closes. So right ventricle constricts, so it squishes the blood, and the blood has come from the right atrium, goes through this tricuspid valve, which is also called the right atrioventricular valve, into the right ventricle. When the right ventricle contracts, the tricuspid valve closes so that blood doesn't go back into the right atrium. And instead, the pulmonary valve, so this is a semilunar valve, the pulmonary valve opens and the blood's ejected from the right ventricle through the pulmonary valve into the pulmonary arteries. And the pulmonaries go to the left and the right side of the lungs to get oxygenated blood. From the pulmonary arteries, blood passes through the branching vessels to the pulmonary capillaries of the alveoli, where oxygen exchange takes place. Oxygenated blood then flows through the pulmonary capillary network. Vessels begin to merge together, increasing in size, eventually becoming the pulmonary veins. And the pulmonary veins bring blood into the left atrium. Okay, so here's your pulmonary veins coming from the left side of the lungs, the right side of the lungs, into the left atrium. Blood flows from the left atrium through the atrioventricular valve, so the mitral valve, also called the bicuspid valve. So this one's tricuspid because it has three little flaps that create a valve. This one's also called the bicuspid valve. Into the left ventricle. During systole, the mitral valve snaps shut. So this little bicuspid valve snaps shut. The ventricle contracts and the blood enters the coronary arteries and the aorta, so the coronary arteries, uh, you can't see them on this particular drawing, but it enters the aorta through the aortic valve. So this is the aortic valve, and this is our main concern. So it enters the aorta. The aorta is the biggest artery in the body, and the aorta, the aorta um, branches into various arteries throughout the body. So from the aorta, the blood travels through the arterial branches to tissue capillaries, oxygen and nutrient exchanges occurred, uh, deoxygenated blood travels back to the heart. So it's just continuous circular method. So that being said, the aorta branches, we'll talk about it, the subclavian arteries and the carotid artery is what the aorta branches into cranially. And then the aorta continues and becomes the de descending aorta and goes all the way right down into the tail. So this is a good picture of the anatomy as well. This is a good one um, in general, but... It also helps to explain it once we get the cow heart in lab. So this is just cut open. So we have our little atrioventricular valves are very, very thin pieces of tissue, okay? And they have tiny little strings attached to them. And those strings attached to them are called the chordae tendinae. And you can see the spelling here. So chordae tendinae. And the chordae tendinae are attached to this little specialized thick grouping of musculature called the papillary muscles. So when the heart contracts, those papillary muscles get the message to then contract. They pull down on the chordae chorda tendinae and open up those little valves. The auricles, so looking at the external heart, the auricles are the largest and most visible part of the atria. Atria for two, atrium for one. 
So that's the auricle. The left ventricle is long and narrow. It's very thick walled. It's the thickest part of the heart and it terminates at the apex of the heart. And the reason it's the thickest part of the heart is because it has to push blood from the heart to go all the way down throughout the body. Okay, whereas the right ventricle just has to push blood to go to the lungs, not very far away. The left ventricle has to push that oxygenated blood all the way through the body. The right ventricle is broader surface area, broader surface area and wraps around the left ventricle. The aorta is the largest artery in the body and the walls of the aorta are the thickest of any blood vessel. Sinoatrial node, I'm assuming Dr. Parr talks to you about more in regard to physiology, but the sinoatrial node are specialized, or it's a specialized area of cardiac muscle cells located in the right atrium. So it generally generates electrical impulses that trigger repeated beating of the heart. So this essentially is our body's pacemaker. And when people have um, various issues in regarding electroconductivity in the heart, so diff different electrical impulses are being interpreted in the wrong way in the heart, you can get ventricular fibrillation, atrial fibrillation, and what that means is the heart's beating rapidly and erratically. So in those cases, a pacemaker is put in, uh, a mechanical pacemaker, and it replicates the effect of the sinoatrial node. So looking at our vascular anatomy, we've got the subclavian arteries branch off the aorta and travel toward the thoracic limbs. The car carotid arteries branch off one or both subclavian arteries and carry on into the, the facial area. So here's our artery from the heart. We have subclavian arteries, brachioceph or, yeah, brachiocephalic artery. And just to note that the carotid artery runs up along the neck. Okay, on either side, and it sits underneath the jugular vein. Really important to know, the carotid artery sits just deep to the, the jugular vein. And then the main trunk of the aorta, here, if you can see this slight bend, arches dorsally, so toward the back, and then travels caudally. Okay, and it branches out to connect all those various abdominal organs with nice oxygenated blood carries on into the, the pelvic limbs, and terminates in the coccygeal area, so right in the tail. So where it splits at the hind limb, limbs, so the pelvic limbs, it branches into iliac arteries, okay, iliac arteries, and then further into the femoral arteries. And when we're taking a pulse on a dog and cat, we often use the femoral arteries. Okay, continues down the leg, branching off into pedal arteries, so on the feet. And the coccygeal artery emerges at the caudal aorta. In regard to venipuncture, um, venipuncture is referring to obviously taking blood from the veins. We do also take arterial blood samples sometimes more in critical patients than in your daily pre-anesthetic profile, that kind of thing. So arterial pa um, blood samples are done. Uh, one day you'll learn to take arterial blood samples. Not very often, and it's more of a, um, uh, there's a little bit more preparation that goes into it than your typical venipuncture because they are very highly specialized, the arteries, and muscular and high blood pressure. So venipuncture in dogs and cats, we often use the cephalic vein. I find more so in dogs than cats. Femoral vein is very common in cats, and it's the medial aspect of the hind limb. So we also call the femoral vein the medial saphenus. Lateral saphenus is the lateral aspect of the hind limb as well. Jugular veins, common to use in both dogs and cats. It's on the ventral aspect of each side of the neck in the jugular groove, very close to the carotid artery. Have to be very careful not to, not to accidentally hit the carotid artery. So we try not to go too deep with our jugular pokes, so our venipuncture using a needle into the jugular vein. We try to keep it as superficial as possible. Most common animal that you'll hit the carotid artery with is a horse. And what happened a few years ago, Stony at Seneca, one of our horses, had venipuncture performed. The individual accidentally struck the carotid artery. Carotid artery, once it's, uh, sometimes when it's struck with a needle, it gets muscle spasms. So the artery itself spasmed and that stopped blood flow 
and Stony went down. So it's a moment where their body's not receiving the blood flow it needs, they're not getting enough blood to the brain, they stop, they drop, and then they slowly recover and get back up. So definitely don't want to don't want to do that. Um, venipuncture, <clears throat> you can also use the caudal epigastric vein. It's also called the milk vein. It's most common in animals that are milk producing, so goats and cows typically, sheep as well. We don't use it often. It's for very, very minute sampling. Don't use it very often because it, it can cause hematoma. So it's a very fragile, very thin-walled vein. Very commonly causes a hematoma. A hematoma is when blood escapes around the vein, either during or after uh, venipuncture, and it causes a bruise. Coxygeal vein is a common one that we use for cattle where you lift up their tail and take it from the coccygeal vein. We also use the coccygeal artery too for uh, getting a heart rate on cattle, for getting a pulse. All right, and that is it.